you've got this guy built up with his team of people or the team of people he was working with and they have cracked this code. And why do they need computers? Where did Colossus come in? Colossus came in because the sheer amount of counting that you had to do was enormous. You were basically, in the end, looking for the occurrences of dots or zeros in, well, 41 times 31 times 5 times whatever, you know, you might be able to afford to get the whole research section doing just one little bit of it. But day in, day out, all you wanted to do was to look for patterns and count up the number of zeros within them. And you need a computer. It doesn't matter if it's a special purpose computer, which Colossus was. When they first realised this, they tried to go back to Enigma type technology. Oh, we understand about relays and uniselectors. Let's build something electromechanical. It was called Heath Robinson. And for those of you in North America, Heath Robinson is the direct equivalent of Rube Goldberg. They were both cartoonists that drew impossibly complicated electromechanical machines and made cartoons out of them. So there's this huge amount of stuff to be counted up, but electromechanically, when they tried to do it, it couldn't go fast enough. It would take days. And they tried to speed the machines up and they just went up in blue smoke. And eventually, I think Alan Turing had worked with Tommy Flowers from Dollis Hill um, GPO, General Post Office. He'd worked with them for some aspect of the Enigma decode. But as we know, Enigma electromechanical was just about OK. But Turing said, why, why not let's get in Flowers for an opinion? And Max Newman, who was by then head of the research, he said, all right, bring him in, we'll have a chat. And uh, Flowers took one look at it and said, you will never get it fast enough to do what you want electromechanically. Forget it. We've got to go electronic and use valves. And of course, there's a huge flowers. Are you off your head? We all know valves, they go bang every few minutes. They're not reliable. I think I've said this before, but I'll say it again. Tommy said to them, I've been doing research on use of thermionic valves in telephone exchanges. And I can tell you, they can be remarkably reliable so long as you never turn them off. And it's particularly the heaters on the cathodes. If you bring those up to voltage very quickly so they instantly go red or white hot, the filament will go bang. But if you bring them up very carefully through dull red to bright red and all that, and then at the end of the day, don't switch them all off, lower the voltage and do that very, very carefully you will minimise the number of thermionic valve blowouts you get. And so basically, the message was never ever turn them off and it'll be fine. And in the end it was. And the electronic speeds were just about enough, but it still took a typical run on Colossus to discover initial settings on a pair of wheels might take 10 minutes, something like that. And you've got to do that for five different pairs, so you know, you take about an hour um, to work out settings if you didn't know them already. Uh, standing order said you must never take more than two hours. If you haven't got it sorted by then on the settings, give up, go to another message. But then if you knew the settings but didn't know the wheel patterns, that was a huge amount of effort was needed. In fact, Frank Carter reckons 10 hours of Colossus time to establish what the patterns of ones and zeros were on the wheels. Now you realise why they ended up with 10 colossi at Bletchley Park. They've got a huge amount of work to do. And you mustn't also run away with the idea that Colossus could do absolutely everything. It couldn't. The great majority it could. But it relied on this slight statistical disparity. There are always more zeros than ones. And look for that. what setting makes that happen. But just occasionally a rogue message would come in where it just happened to be 50-50 and there wasn't a skew or a bias. And then you had to throw that one away and say, we'll come back to that later. So it wasn't 100%, but it was good enough to make a decisive difference to the war. Yes, it seems weird, doesn't it, that it's not 50-50 between zeros and ones uh, in, a, in a regime where we're doing exclusive ores. Well, what you've got to remember is if you exclusive or something with itself, you get a bunch of zeros. But whatever it is, you exclusive all those together. If they're identical, 
the exclusive ore on a character basis will be five zeros. And to make those show up at Bletchley, they denoted it with a forward slash, if you remember. OK, well, that's all very well. But that... So how would that lead to a, a bias, a skew? Answer. <clears throat> In many, many languages, not the least German and not the least English, which, as we must remember, is a Germanic language, you get doubled letters. OK, so, Sean, if I say to you, I'm guessing <laughs> the probability of Z in English is one one hundredth. What's the probability of getting two Zs? One one hundredth times one one hundred? Well, that would be the mathematical answer. Yeah, yeah. If they're all independent, it will be one in ten thousand, but they're not. Double Z is far more common, in, even in English, let alone in German, than one in 10,000. Really, you know, dazzle, puzzle, all these kind of things. It's not massively common as a bigram, but it's more common than the base probabilities would indicate. Double P's as well. Happy, slappy, flappy, all these kind of things. So character doubling was one of the uh, vital components of saying that if you look on a certain stream and it's a zero and you look on the adjacent streams from two to five and it's a zero as well then it's a null character and that could have been generated by having one thing exclusive order with its identical thing so on a bit stream basis they adapted that and said the reason we are seeing more zeros is that if you slide these bit streams over each other by one bit and exclusive order them you'll find that double letters occurrences lead eventually to more zeros coming out than ones because on the nature of exclusive or if something is the same as something else and you're exclusive for it it gives zeros not ones so it's a bit rough and ready and hand wavy there's more to it than that but that is just one example of how the language structure itself can do you in and it's reported that the german cryptanalysts realized that this would be a weakness of the lawrence cipher but they said we're not to worry it would need you to build a machine and they'll never be able to do that there'll be so much data it will kill them you'd need roomfuls of people and uh, even within a month they wouldn't do it but what they didn't foresee was the advent of machines with electronic speeds not just electromechanical ones and that could just about get on top of it Will the manipulating bits era become obsolete in a few years or basics will never change? I think basics will always be there. In some sense, we will always have to worry about how much memory we have, how much processor time we have. So he was being all informal. He's saying, hi, Dave, in Playtext 2.